All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, here. I'm, I'm Jason Carrion from Quartz. We're here to talk about the fundamentals and the infinite possibilities of universal basic income. Uh, it's one of the few policy ideas, I think, that have something of broad support across the political spectrum, which is a pretty rare commodity these days. So it's definitely worth, um, worth us sort of chewing it over here. Um, uh, they explained a bit about, about what it is, but this is kind of unconditional uh, money given to every citizen. That would make it universal. There's no strings attached. It would replace a lot of the welfare state, perhaps. That's kind of the core of it. Um, so some advocates would see it as reducing state bureaucracy. Some would see it as supporting like the, the working poor or, 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 or people who have trouble getting jobs. Um, it could support people who lose their jobs to automation and technology, and I think that's why we're probably talking about it here, and that's why basic income seems to be having a moment now, I think, because a lot of sort of Silicon Valley firms are getting involved. A lot of other people at the, the coal face, so to speak, of tech, technology see what it could do to the labor market, and that means that maybe there won't be as many jobs as there um, are now, uh, or it could be for some other purpose or a combination of uh, factors. So um, to put it in terms that I think maybe are more appropriate to this, to this type of gathering, uh, one, of, one of our panelists has described uh, basic income. Uh, it, it could be a way to rewrite the source code of the state, Robo. You said that it could be the operating system of the post-industrial state, which I think is a pretty cool term. So I'm uh, joined by my panel here, Ropa, uh, Albert, and Matt, to, to uh, talk about um, basic income. There's some very interesting things happening both in Finland and in Silicon Valley. We have two um, uh, uh, people here from that, just to, to sort of run through it really quickly. In Finland, starting next year, we have um, a pilot where 2,000 people will get 560 euros a month. That's right, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, starting in Oakland, California, we have a sort of pilot study where 100 people will get $1,500 a month in preparation for a study where 1,000 people will get sort of that amount. And there's similar um, experiments happening in the Netherlands, Canada, other types of places. So that's the background. Um, uh, Albert, I wanted to start with you with a, with a, with a slightly controversial question, perhaps. Um, the uh, techies getting very involved in basic uh, income at the moment, is um, it, it's, it's a worthy goal, obviously, but is this the kind of uh, techno-utopian overreach? They see the government, they see the welfare state as something to be disrupted, like food delivery, like, like, uh, like, like taxis. I mean, this, this is really, really big. Are they overstepping themselves a bit with taking this on? Well, I think, as you said at the beginning, people are coming at this from very different angles, right? And there's definitely people who see this as a much simpler system, one that can be administered by computers, and that's appealing to some people. But I think the reason why people in technology see this as interesting is because in the things that we invest in and the things that we build, we can kind of see the future approaching maybe faster than you can see it when you're further away from these types of companies. So um, we recently invested in a company called Clarify that does image recognition as a service. And uh, if you take image recognition as a task, uh, until about five years ago, computers really sucked at it. I mean, they were just terrible at it. And we've gone from computers being really terrible at it to computers being really, really good at it in the space of five years. And so I think people who work in technology see this kind of progress and the rate of that progress much more clearly in front of us. And so I think we're thinking as a result much more about, okay, what does that all mean? And, um, um, and how can we set ourselves up so that we can embrace this so that this can be a good thing as opposed to something that we need to be afraid of? Yeah. Um, the, the Finnish example, which Demos Helsinki was, was very much involved in, was pitched as a way to promote work, which to me seems almost the exact opposite with some of the, the people in tech saying there will be no jobs, the robots will take them all. So how, how do you, can you reconcile that, those two? Yeah, yeah, they are absolutely kind of opposites, and that's what makes basic income as an idea so beautiful. Uh, kind of the Silicon Valley or the technology-driven uh, idea, which I've 
totally subscribe to is that we're not going to see many of the jobs that we have now. The nature of profession even is going to change and so forth. So we need to replace income uh, with something. And uh, however, the Finnish government is looking at it from a totally different point of view. Because, you know, Robert Solov says that uh, you get growth uh, by looking at how much employment there is, uh, how much labor there is in the market, and how sophisticated the, the labor is. And you put capital on that and growth comes. And now the Finnish government uh, is trying to get the economy growing. It's not growing fast enough, nearly fast enough here. Uh, so they think that by increasing the amount of labor uh, in the market, you can get the, uh, uh, get the economy growing. And why do they think that basic income is a tool for that? Uh, quite simply because we already have quite a good basic income, but it's just in hundreds of different types of instruments you have to apply for, and that means that you never really know whether you're better off not taking the job than you would be in taking a job. For example, driving an Uber or something that is slightly uh, less, uh, less secure. So this is from the Finnish government is doing the same experiment for the totally different reasons. Uh, and that's what makes it, it makes it, of course, uh, interesting to have this conversation, for example. So the, the Y Combinator um, experiment in, in Oakland, I mean, it, you guys are obviously a technology investor to firm this, this kind of thing. I mean, when hearing what the Finns are doing, um, how do you reconcile that there? Are, are, you are surveying the people when they, you know, every month, I think, I think it is. I mean, uh, you know, we're not human because we have jobs, but work also gives us a sense of identity and community and that kind of thing. I mean, what sort of questions are you dealing with there or hoping to discover from your, from your pilot, let's say, around the nature of work and how it, you know, culturally affects us? Yeah, so our study is very focused on the individual effects of understanding yeah. basic income, trying to really see how it could improve people's economic security, how people will be spending their time. Um, I do think it's absolutely very complementary with what the Finnish government is doing as well. And I think one thing to think about it too in the context of technological change and how the jobs could be going away at some point, you know, it's not going to be this instant thing overnight that's just going to suddenly happen. It's going to be the sudden gradient that, you know, job security will erode at first. Already in the US we see many types of jobs switching to contract type of labor that's less secure than full employment with benefits. Um, and then we also see positive effects where the costs of lots of things are driven down by this type of technological advancement as well, uh, where many things become more affordable and just the concept of basic income becomes more affordable as well. So I think we'll see this gradient over time where there will be more room to expand the idea of the social safety net and the form of social safety net itself and we'll be working towards these types of things gradually. Okay. I, I wanted to just jump in on this. Uh, I think the point you made is spot on. There's a lot of the existing welfare programs all around the world have a weird structure where they disincentivize work because if you start to work, you lose all your benefits. And so you face sort of this cliff. And I think one thing that people often don't understand about basic income is that basic income doesn't prevent you from working. <laughs> and, um, and every dollar you earn is a dollar on top of your basic income. And so it doesn't have that same kind of weird cliff structure and disincentive. Um, I also thought that the introductory comment before we came on stage was super spot on, which is um, there are certain types of labor supply that uh, require you to take risk. So if you want to become an independent provider um, you know, of, of like education services or counseling services, uh, you need to be able to sustain um, some fluctuations in your income. You may or may not have clients at any one point in time. And so basic income will enable a lot of people to be supplying entrepreneurial labor, so to speak, uh, in whole new efforts. Um, and many of these are efforts where we are going to want a human, not a machine. Like if, you know, if I want to go talk to somebody about a problem I'm having, if I want to coach, for instance, um, I'm probably going to want to talk to a human and not a machine. Yeah. We, we had talked earlier about, and you were saying that part of something that could happen from these, from having a basic income or, or these types of experiments is that labor becomes more expensive, that you have this, this walk away option, I think you, you talked about, and that, and that being a good thing, which for many executives, they, 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 they're not thinking that way, but for society as a whole, that might be 
the goal. Yeah, so and, I, I, I think when people look at um, labor unions and the history of labor, um, they often go, oh, well, it was bad because labor unions made labor expensive. But when we made labor expensive in Europe, we also created capital. That is, we created a need to invest in machines. If you look at economies like India that had very cheap, very abundant labor, you didn't have capital accumulation. And so we, one reason to give people a walkaway option from driving a truck or a walkaway option from flipping burgers at McDonald's is because those are areas that we can and should automate. And then there are other areas like you know, coaching or education, childcare, et cetera, that in fact we don't want to automate, even if we could. And so if we have cheap labor in some places, we will tie humans up in activities that aren't great human activities to begin with. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think labor should be expensive. If something should be expensive, it's our time, our yes. fancy. Uh, and and that's, that's, a, that's a no-brainer. We have now an immense amount of jobs that one could really quite easily automate. Jobs that do not require or benefit from human interaction. It's even degrading to have human interaction in, in one of these things. We have people who wash cars. You know, you, you have people, you give them money, and then you have seven people coming, you wash cars. We have people who, you know, take your order when you want hamburgers. Uh, we have, you know, things like that, that clearly do not add value uh, and, 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 and should be, uh, should of course, uh, therefore be abolished. However, the problem is that Work is the primary way through which people relate to the society. And that is something that I don't think... Uh, that is a conversation that we haven't had yet. Uh, and that's a fundamental conversation. And basic income is, of course, kind of like one toolbox, uh, one you know, tool in the box through which we can renew the whole concept of work and the you know, whole concept of how people relate to the society. But now, I don't think... Uh, a vision there is ready yet, because our vision is that uh, let robots do the dirty work and we'll give the displaced people basic income. There's something missing, you know, there's missing the part that how do you then relate to the society if you're not, you're not working? And I don't, we might be buying that, uh, but I don't think the majority of the people will be buying that. I, if we look at the political climate nowadays, it's very much driven by populism that feeds from these type of ideas that, you know, we'll have rip robots or Chinese uh, to kind of replace uh, US workers. So, so we are in, and this is what I meant by saying that it, it could be the moonshot, because it, it kind of reveals such a massive, uh, massive change. You know, there was nothing in the moon, uh, but still people wanted to go there, and it kind of galvanized them, and it, 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 it created uh, a movement of progress from science to politics to capital, that then created USA as, a, as, as the kind of leader in, 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 in that kind of forward-looking uh, forward thinking. However, well, my point is that basic income is kind of a must. It, it has to happen. Uh, however, at the same time as we work on that, we should be trying to think of like, okay, so how will people relate to the society when there isn't any factory jobs, service jobs, you know, there's human interaction jobs, but you know, some of them might be also kind of at least assisted by AI and so forth. Yeah. I, think, I think that's often the criticism of thinking about basic income in the context of all of the jobs really being replaced uh, with something conceptually like basic income. You know, people just won't have meaning in their lives. I think, though, I think that aspect of meaning can't really be centrally planned the, the way that basic income potentially could be. I think we can establish the safety net for people so they will definitely be able to be taken care of. And I don't know how much that ameliorates the problems you kind of mentioned around populist movements that are very worried about these types of things. Um, but the, the aspect of meanings and how people would really reorganize themselves, I think we just have to see to some degree how that would play out. I don't think we can really pre-plan for that too heavily. Yeah. Well, um one thing I'm, I'm interested to ask to ask you all, uh, you know, we're we're here talking about basic income at a tech conference, which I think is 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 kind of <laughs> telling. It's definitely sort of having a moment. I think it's been around. It's been, these ideas have been around for centuries, but at, you know, it, it seems quite quite hot, quite trendy. 
at the moment. And I think it seems to me quite intentionally on the Finnish side and also on the Silicon Valley side that after some great fanfare around we're doing these big pilots, this, this is actually happening now in, in, in practice, um, you guys have, have gone maybe a bit uh, more quiet. Um, and, and we were talking earlier about how it's best maybe not to get ahead of ourselves on this, and this is like a very long-term project, and the hype cycle, as if it was, this was an app or a new uh, <laughs> social network or something, could end up kind of thwarting interest in it, that, that if, you know, the, these, these studies drag, then people would be like, ah, oh, basic income, it doesn't, it doesn't work. But, but, and I think that gets back to my first question, that this is like a bigger thing than, than just disrupting government or something like that. Yeah. I mean, is that... Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, conver- the fact that this is talked about is obviously good, but what's missing from the conversation is the idea of like, okay, if this is on the hype cycle, how long it will take for it to penetrate? My guess is 15 uh, years or something like that. Uh, what we have to understand is the scale of it, that we, we're at the very core of the state, handing out something that is universal. There hasn't been anything universal in our generation. It has been all the kind of renewals to the state have been to do with some specific group. There have been kind of tweaks to the system, if you like. The last universals uh, have been made in the 70s, uh, at least in the Europe. And then it's just been kind of like making sure that this special group gets access to that service or this thing gets more, more of regulated. It, it hasn't been universal, so that's, that's one. Secondly, it's about handing money. It's not just any kind of thing. It's, it's something that creates contracts between people, yeah, usually. That's what kind of money, money does uh, essentially, essentially when. And thirdly, it's the biggest part of any stage budget. It's the social uh, welfare and health, of course, uh, a budget. So, you know, we are here in, in something like more like creating a new operating system than an app. It's something that will take quite a long time. So, the, of course, they worry about if everyone starts talking about it now, and then they will look at these two experiments and say that, okay, they tried it, but I don't know. Uh, there will be, I guess there will be three, four, five experiments uh, in Finland if they really want to do it, yeah. uh, to be able to gather enough data uh, about anything really to do with basic income. Yeah, I, I think the reason in my mind why the change will really take a long time is because we've spent... We've just been 200 years establishing a narrative about how important work is to people's identity. Um, we've created things like the Protestant work ethic. We've woven it into religion, into culture, into our everyday lives, into the education system. The education system is very heavily skewed towards equipping people for work as opposed to, let's say, equipping people to appreciate art or knowledge for its own sake. Um, and so we have woven this so deeply into the fabric of society that undoing that, what we've done over 200 years, will not happen in a month or a year. Right. Um, is there, so speaking to, to, to that kind of point, is there kind of a branding issue and a narrative around this that will help it persist if this is going to take a long time? If it has to survive, for example, different political administrations, which is always a dicey proposition. I mean, what, what's the sort of narrative around basic income? You know, obviously, like money for nothing, free money, all that kind of stuff gets, gets, gets a little tricky. Um, you know, there's, you know we, could, we could talk about things like negative income tax, uh, inclusive social security, someone mentioned it to me. Like, so there's just the specific branding. Seed but money for the, the people. Narrative. What's that? <laughs> Seed money for the people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I actually think it could benefit from going the opposite type of direction, becoming something that's slightly more mundane in the shorter term, and we could see something that approximates the idea of basic income much sooner, perhaps with a smaller amount of money. I think... You know, just the idea of unconditional cash as a form of safety net, that's something the organization Give Directly has been doing a lot of work on and has been showing in a developing context is very promising. I think, you know, at least in a U.S. context, uh, the idea of just giving people cash for nothing is highly stigmatized, at least with a large portion of the population. But I think if, you know, we switch the conversation to something like that, we're just even in addition to the existing safety net we have, we're giving people... A thousand, two thousand dollars. Who might be the no- most needy type of people, and it proves to be a very beneficial type of safety net. Then that really lays out the piping for getting to something like large-scale basic income, the way people think about it, as we're discussing uh, in a sooner context. I think. Yeah, I is tend it- to agree uh, with both of you. I think the ultimate problem is that they, we. It's very difficult to experiment with framing. 
because you, you can only get it right once, you know, and then, you know, if, if it fails, it fails. I like the idea of seed money, uh, you know, for citizens, for people. Uh, and then I would like to see something that people could kind of report what they have done. I don't mean that they, it would be conditional, but they could say, you know, this month I've done that, this type of a thing. It would be some kind of like qualitative reporting or something. They would post that I've, uh, I've taken these kids to school or, you know, whatever it happens to be. My activities have been like this to get some kind of Uh, conversation going on about that, what activities, which is like post-work societies or activity. Is, is this not a populist policy, giving everyone money? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the nice things in U.S. history is to trace back the, this idea all the way to the founding fathers, right? Um, so, um, you know, I just called it seed money, um, you know, uh, you, The word that we haven't talked about is freedom yet. And um, I do think it fundamentally frees people up, right? It frees people up to be completely free about how they allocate their time. Uh, and in the early history of the United States, um, you know, we're a country of immigrants. Uh, I'm an immigrant to the United States. Um, but in the early history of immigration, there was land. Um, land we obviously had taken away from Native Americans, but there was land and so, The idea was that the seed thing that you would get is you would get a plot of land, and that plot of land would give you freedom to live freely from you know, the aristocracies that people were fleeing in, in Europe. Um, and Thomas Paine w was one of the first ones to point out that you're going to run out of land at some point, and what are you going to give people then to make them free? And so, to me, some framing around this is about freedom and individual freedom Uh, is central to this idea. It's like post-industrial pioneers or homesteading yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, how is, is Y Combinator, who I think is the furthest along in terms of like, like a private, um, privately run basic income experiment, how much is the political climate affecting you or how much are you thinking about how this will eventually or should it inform when this needs to scale and governments need to get involved. I mean, I mean, are you just testing it kind of in theory, see if it works, and then hopefully the officials can learn some yeah. lessons? Or My hope is we're designing it in a context that won't necessarily jump to implementing into policy right after the study we do, but would be appealing enough in a way that it could jump to a government scale type study after that, be it partnering with a state of California or the federal government to do a much larger scale study. I think we are trying to make sure that everything we're doing with the study is policy relevant in that sense. Yeah, and you, you had mentioned to me earlier too, which I found very interesting, is that some of the people who are in the pilot now were, I guess, were unbanked before and you give them a bank account and give them cash and stuff, and, and that seems to me to be kind of an important kind of side effect in a way. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting, uh, ancillary effect of how we've designed the study, at yeah. least thus far. Uh, it is a huge problem with uh, many poor populations in the U.S. They are completely underbanked still. So they don't have any access to bank accounts. And as a necessity of the study, we do need an easy mechanism to be giving people uh, bank accounts. So we've actually partnered with a company, Green Dot, uh, that focuses on this type of problem to be giving people bank accounts in the study. Um, and we'll see what type of effects that even has in participants' right. well-being as well. And so with that, too, if I'm right, uh, you guys running the study um, see the transactions of these people and what they're doing and that kind of stuff to, to, as, as part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. That seems to me like that, that might not scale, a bit, a bit kind of like Big Brother-ish, or, or you do not think of it that way? Well, that's <laughs> something we're testing right now with the pilot. Uh, we'll see if it's actually relevant or not. There's some concern, too, with actually tracking transaction data that a lot of people end up pulling uh, the income back into cash where we can't even really see what they're yeah. doing. So we'll have to see how that plays out over the coming months to see if it's something we want to play into the main study as well. Yeah. Also speaking about the politics of this, I mean, um, you know, the sort of no strings attached, all that kind of stuff. Is there anything you, you had mentioned, you hinted at it. Is it more politically palatable when there's some participation? You have to do something to get it, even if it's not work. How, how it, it, You know, how, is, how are the Finns thinking about, about that, about, like, participation? Mm. You know, there's unconditional cash transfers, but I think to scale it, it seems to me like there, there needs to be some kind of yeah, yeah. contribution. 
I, I think that's been, there's been surprisingly little talk about that. Huh. Finns are surprisingly little worried about people not doing anything. Because obviously we have a you know, quite good benefit system. You, you know, if you don't live in one of the big cities, you can live without a job. Absolutely no problem. Not, you, you won't live a fancy life, but you can support yourself. The basic stuff uh, is there. So there hasn't been much discussion about, oh, why, how can we hand out money without you know, expecting anything? Because we're doing it already. We have done it for 50 years or so. So there hasn't been much talk about that. Uh, I don't like the idea of like, too much participation, but I, as I said, I would like to, you know, people start, it's more like a framing issue that people start thinking that, you know, now that I have this money, where can I use my freedom? Because it's like one thing to have the freedom and the other one is to use it somehow and to get that kind of thinking going. I don't know what it is, but it, there needs to be some kind of forum for that. Uh, in the same sense that, you know, if you invest in a company, they are going to report kind of like what have they done with their product, but you're not yeah. going to make them, you know, uh, be quantitative about how to report. I, know, I mean, you, you've been involved in, 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 in uh, unconditional cash transfers, and that's interesting to you. You talked about freedom earlier. I mean, what, what is your current thinking on whether people need to prove that they're doing something No, I, I, I mean, I, I, um, uh, I think people who belong to a civil society and who follow the laws of that society, who... Um, participate in politics and democracy, those are all things that um, people should be doing and in my mind is the kind of participation that we want. Uh, I really would not like a government program where government says and now you need to work here or there because I think government historically has been a very bad allocator of people's time. So um, I think, you know, something we haven't talked about yet is it's dangerous in my mind to see basic income as some kind of panacea that's going to solve all problems. Um, when we went from the agrarian age to the industrial age, we changed almost everything about how we live. So we went from living in villages and working in farms to living in cities and working factories. We lived in large extended families. We went to nuclear families. We were living by ourselves. Um, so we, we changed you know, we didn't have formal schooling, we went to formal schooling, we changed lots and lots of things around. And I think we have to recognize that the change we're going through now that is as big a transition as the traditional transition from the agrarian age to the industrial age. So, for instance, we haven't talked about education. Education needs to change fairly fundamentally along with this change. Um, Give Directly, which has been doing unconditional cash transfers in Africa for some time, one of the things they found is that just a little bit of education going along with the money saying, hey, we're giving you some money, here's some ideas of what you could do with it, like totally no, changes it the outcome. Yeah. Yes. So um, compared to just saying here's a bunch of money. So I think yeah. we have to think about this much more broadly. There's a lot of accompanying policy and, and, and social changes that have to yeah. happen. Yeah, big ideas. We, we're, we're just about running out of time, but I wanted to ask everyone to just kind of wrap up. What realistically sort of time frame are we talking about here before some notion of basic income becomes a common government policy? And never is also an answer, but, but I imagine none of you will say that. But uh, let's, let's go around there. I would say if everything goes like super well in five years' time, we're going to have some kind of form of basic income. When we get to universal basic income, I think it takes minimum 15 years for it to happen. Over under 50 years? What do you think? Uh, I'm hoping within my lifetime. <laughs> okay. And I'm li leaving open how long I hope that will be. <laughs> I think as soon as three to five years, we could have some form of unconditional cash type policy, at least being tested on a larger scale, state by state in the US. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, great. Well, I wanted to thank uh, Ropa, Albert, and, and, and Matt for talking about this. And, and um, thank you very much for having us. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.